Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm really happy to be here, actually, because it's the second year in, in Scotland. I did a talk last year as well. Uh, so um, I'm going to apologize if I put in swear words. I tend, it's okay. Just, um, so essentially, this talk came about uh, because in 2016, I don't know, 2016, I'll get a little bit into that more, there was a really significant rise in ransomware. And at the time, I was working for a product vendor, and you know, one of the things that they wanted to do was demonstrate how the solution could combat ransomware. Now, I can't tell you the results of that for that particular vendor because of when I left the company, there's certain disclosures or, or, or NDAs that were in place. So one disclaimer is I have never used this or re released this into the public, okay? This was not done for, for, for gain or profit at any time, all right? So a little bit about me. So I've been around in the industry for a long time. It says 25, it's 25 years, actually it's more like 30 years. Um, I'm a lot older than I look. Uh, those are different different versions of me over time. That last image on the right is essentially, lately I've been a little bit muted or, or left you know, unimpressed by what's going on there in our industry. I run B-Sides London. I, I know some of you might be coming, so it's going to be great this year, again. Uh, and I'm a IWSA UK chapter board member. So we actually have a stand here this year. Um, if you want to come and find out what it's about, so it's an interesting association. Uh, there's no certification process or anything like that. It's about bringing people of the, of, in the industry together and doing networking. Um, so in 2016, there was a lot of ex ransomwares being delivered. I mean, it was to the point where you could see one every week, a new variant of, one, of ransomware every week. And it, this led me to look at why do we have this proliferation of ransomware? Why are we doing, why is this happening? Why, do, why is such an interest in, in doing ransomware? And on the side, I also had some, some, let's say, job issues where people were like, we need to demo this, we need to demo this. So I decided to actually look at it, take it apart, and see how I could build my own. But, as I said earlier, I did not release this anywhere. I'm not, it was never used except in a demo environment or as demos. Uh, plus, I mean, every, you'll see that you could basically decrypt the whole thing very easily. So it's not a big. So 2016, the year of ransomware, there was such proliferation. And we saw different versions of ransomware. This is before WannaCry, okay? WannaCry was actually, for me, I think was a wake-up call for our industry, for people, for the world. And there's been less of activity compared to 2016 since WannaCry. And I think it's because people got susceptible um, of what was going on. Plus, you know, you, you have the issue with with um, with malware tech being arrested in the U.S. So some of it died down. There's still ransomware out there. It's just that it's died down in terms of the volume because our attitude has changed. It even got to a point where towards the end of the year, ransomware as a service was being sold on the dark web. So you could actually buy a ransomware as a service and you could release it on your target victim. The ransomware service would take a, would take a cut and you would get the rest. Uh, I, I mean, this is really going into a full industrial process. And we'll talk about that a little bit afterwards. So one of the things that led me to do this research as well is that basically if you've ever worked for a product company, you have the marketing guys who are like, oh, we need to show that our, our product does this. We can show them what, what we can do. And then the sales guys are going, yeah, we want to demo this, but we can't demo it. You know, in a, in a, in a demo environment, we, sometimes we don't have internet. Sometimes we don't have this. We need to be able to do something locally in a VM. We need to be able to do something in a controlled manner, but to demonstrate the value um, and going beyond the, you know, video type value. So I was thinking, oh, so what can I do? What can I do? Well, the easy answer was build something that you could demo, right? And could bring, give them a solution. So that, that's how this whole thing came about. So let's go back to 2016. Uh, so you know, 2016, there was an enormous growth. This is, this is a, a source, source proof, uh, proof point was tracking the growth of ransomwares. And if you look at the year, it started a very, by the end of the, you know, by, by the end of, uh, by September, I mean, we were talking about a 752% increase. Okay, 752% increase. That's a massive increase of variants and of ransomware being released in the, in the wild. One interesting thing in that study was that they actually saw that 
at the beginning of the year, it was mostly malicious documents, and towards the end of the year, it was malicious office documents came about. There was very little URL, and the explanation to that is that if you look at some of the technologies that we're putting into place and filtering on emails, we can easily filter out bad e bad URLs and emails, and we can capture them as they're going out of the uh, out of the company through the perimeter through perimeter solutions. However, the attachments is a little bit more complicated. So documents. You know, malicious office documents were some of the prime, uh, some of the primary mechanisms where they deliver ransomware. But in 2016, we saw something new, which was a zip file with a JavaScript attachment. And if you look at the black line on this chart, you see that over the year it just grew and grew because the malicious parties realized that number one, it was getting through the traditional protection mechanisms, and number two, users were actually clicking on it. So I actually run a honeypot. Um, I don't know if you guys know Xavier Martens. So he's a, he's a, he's a, um, um, a SANS uh, incident response person as well. So he runs a honeypot as well. So we talked and I was like, actually, we talk, I think it was last year, besides, no, the year before, besides Athens, we were talking, we were talking about how we were tracking all these emails in the ransomware. And we saw basically a frequency, right? So there's actually, if you look at this chart over the year, right, you see the spikes during, you know, the month starts very slowly. If you look at like, if you look at this, this part, the month start really slowly, and then it increases over time, right? Over the month, basically, think production release schedules, right? If you're in, if you've done, if you do production IT, what happens is usually when you're rolling out a new application, you might start with the application and say, okay, at the beginning of the month, you roll it out to a few people. Then towards the end of the month, you've up, you've fixed all the bugs, you've created a more stable version, so you roll it out to more people, right? So, and this is what we, this is kind of what we are seeing in the frequency of emails that are going through. If you deep dive into a, a, a month, you actually see that it's even more production type focused. Is that at the beginning of the week, you get the bulk of emails, and then towards the end, you trail off, and the you know the the less you trail off, and you get less frequency. So. There was like a rhythm in in the sense that if you if you think about release schedules, you release at the beginning of the week. If something goes wrong, you have the week to fix it. In this case, basically, you were, they were releasing at the beginning of the week and optimizing the delivery mechanism over the over the week and over the month. Um, we saw that there was a lot, a majority on that in last in 2016 of zip files, right? So the attachments were primarily zip files. If you look at the blue, you know, the blue, the light blue at the top, at the top of the the pie chart, that's Office Word files. The dark, pur the purple is, is Excel, right? So there's very little. You know, these one, these ones are the ones I'm talking about. It's very little of these Word documents were actually coming in, because there was. Uh, Microsoft actually thought about what was going on, so they started to deactivate macros. They started to actually protect the office infrastructure, the office pr applications themselves. So you got it was less, it was hard, getting harder and harder to actually deliver ransomware via office documents. So they switched to the zip mechanism. The advantage of doing the zip mechanism is they could, if needed, password protect the zip file. If you password protect the zip file, it just goes through any kind of email solution that you have because it doesn't know how to read the zip file. And they were they were in the zip file. They were just addressing it as a JavaScript or a Visual Basic script, and those were going through, because most solutions don't actually take the, the those scripts and and de analyze them or are capable of analyzing them. And you don't really have a signature to actually match this. So what is ransom? Well, I mean, let, we'll, we'll, let's dig a little bit into ransomware, right? So the principles of this is a chart from F Secure, right? So they, over time, have kind of highlighted the different variants of ransomware. And if you look at 2016, you basically, 2016 starts here, and you look at the number of different variants that were actually released over the months, it's immense, right, compared to the previous years. There was just an explosion of variants, and some of them were very minor modifications. Some of them went from a JavaScript to an executable, for example. So it's, it's extremely... Prolific, and there's a, and there's a lot of action going on in 2016. Essentially, you'll find that Java, that these types of ransomware come in probably four different variations. 
So the first one and the easiest one to actually do is you have a command line based solution. So there's a lot of ransomware in 2016 that started off essentially as either a Python script, a PHP script, and even PowerShell towards the end of the year. Um, there's, there's, there was one the, in the gray, gray box. All it was was the ransomware downloaded 7-zip and just 7-zip password, password protected the files. And that was just a batch file, a Microsoft Windows batch file. And the reason they're doing this is because it's easy. It's really, it's really f easy to get in, and it's really easy to actually bypass security applications. Because, I mean, the command line basically says, oh, hi, oops. Let me go back. Why isn't this working? So if you look at basically what it does is it deploys 7-zip with a different name, so a.0.exe, and then does the 7-zip command. The thing with 7-zip is most um, you know, endpoint protection systems will just flag it as okay because it's a valid, it's a valid executable. You know, it's a valid tool. And this is one of the problems with, you know, we're still seeing today is that because some of these malicious parties can actually use these tools against us, there's no protection, right? Because you're not going to disable PowerShell. You can't really disable PowerShell. The only thing you can do is monitor and control. So the second type of real rant, the second type of ransomware we see is essentially just using uh, either an executable or a script and applying a SHA or a hashing technique. So these don't work very well because it's quite easy to reverse. So when you hear that, you know, F-Secure, Kaspersky released a decryption tool, whatever, it's because it's usually one of these types, th these two types of ransomwares because the password's embedded in the script or the hash is really easy to decode. So they can, back they can backtrack the hash. After that, you basically get into the more complex stuff. So then you get into a binary that's using a real encryption technology, right? So a real encryption system. So AES, GOST, uh, DES and triple DES, ROT13, or XOR. So these essentially use a, a single secret key, apply the encryption to the, to the file, and that key is also stored somewhere and they decrypt it, right? So the thing with the first two is it's actually quite easy to deploy. You don't need to, you can embed the, the key in, inside the, the executable or the script. On the third one, you have two options. You can embed the key, but then you, it's easy to find. Or you have to just basically generate a key and store it somewhere. So you need an infrastructure in the back, in the back end. And that's where you get into your command and controls. And you have and, and servers to actually manage these keys. So you need a key management system. The fourth type is a lot more complex and rarely seen. So those use an RSA type encryption. And the problem with that is you need a public key and a private key. So essentially what happens is the ransomware connects to the backend control system, requests the key, the backend key management system generates a private key look, uh, securely in, it, in its infrastructure and gives the, gives the ransomware the public key and the public key is used to encrypt the, 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 the endpoint. Typically, so like if you get hit by ransomware, if you, if you get hit by the third, the, variant, the third variant on this list, you'll see that your ransomware note is always the same. So it says, you know, you've got a ransomware, pay Bitcoin, this is your ID, give us your ID. The ID will always be the same because the encryption key is always the same. If you have the, the fourth one, you'll get a separate different encryption, uh, encryption notice and ransomware note for each endpoint that gets affected. Because it just generate every time it hits an endpoint, it generates a new key. That's how the mechanism works. So, what are the stages of an attack? So, the stages of an attack are actually quite simple. So, there's first the delivery mechanism. So, that's typically an email phishing campaign. Then there's the execution. So, that's when you, the phishing campaign, you know, the user opens it, it executes a, it, it executes a binary or a script, script. It then goes into the encryption phase. So, the encryption phase is essentially that's when it happens, right? That's when the file gets encrypted and you, get your, you lose access to your files. Very important here is that the encryption phase, the good and proper ransomwares will encrypt first and rename second. 
So if you have a solution that basically, and I'll talk about this a little bit afterwards, if your solution is looking at renaming of files, you're basically too late in most cases because the file's already encrypted inside. You then have, depending on the type of ransomware, you have a spread phase. So like WannaCry basically would infect, you know, it would affect the endpoint, rank encrypt, and then it would spread to other, it would look for other endpoints to, to target. The spread phase is actually optional. Um, essentially because depending on the, it depends on the militia, militia sector and the, and the infrastructure they have in the background. And typically in parallel, I mean, I put it afterwards, but in parallel to the spread, you also display the ransom note. There's also some activity in that encrypt phase, towards the end of the encrypt phase, which is the persistence. So you add persistence mechanisms onto the endpoint so that if the user reboots, he gets, and the, the ransom note gets redisplayed and you, you carry on like that. So I'm going a little bit fast. Because it's time, time conscious. So let's get our hands dirty. So that, that was the background. So how do you actually build one of these things? Well, it's a piece of software, right? So you think, okay, I'm going to go through software development lifecycle. It's like, no. The malicious party's not going to do that, right? The malicious actors are not going to go through a whole backend pro process like this. That said, some of the organized, some of the organized um, actors in the, on the dark web actually do have a full software development cycle for some of their CNC stuff, right? So they actually have a plan, they have QA, they have help desks and things like that. But that wasn't the goal. So the goal is that I wanted to see the attractiveness and the simplicity of actually deploying this, right? So I switched more to a mind map type model, right? So thinking about software development, what stages I need, what I need in my software. So this is the mind map of what I needed. So, sorry, I'm gonna turn away for a sec. So basically, I decided, okay, so I have my ransomware that I want to build. So I need a delivery mechanism first. So I have to think about how I'm going to deliver it. So email or web drive by, those are the two most common. That's what you usually see. I decide to go for email. So you either you do a JavaScript and a zip, or you do a word attachment. Uh, this could be other things apart from JavaScript. The most common as a, you know, from the stats was it was JavaScript or the word attachment. Because this was a demo and it was quite, you know, it had to be simple, I just left it as a word attachment. Then you get to the encryption phase. So this is where it becomes more interesting because in the encryption phase, you're actually going to build the software. So you need to have a programming environment. So there's this different options. You can do a PHP, you can do PowerShell, you can go all the way to, you know, C Sharp, Python, C, uh, C++, depending on your preferences. But if you choose that type of, uh, you know, some of the more advanced programming languages, it it intensifies the complexity of your ransomware. So you're not going to get a quick and easy, dirty solution. You then need your code, your actual code. So the actual code is pretty simple. You set the key, right? You pass the disk. For each file, you're going to look for files that are doc, text, Excel, zip, JPEG, typical business files, right? You're not going to encrypt everything. There's a reason for that, and I'll explain it a little bit later. You also are not going to look through every folder. Essentially, if you do look for every folder, you might hit system folders and create a blue screen, which is counterproductive. You then have your run phase. So basically, your run phase is you're going to launch the script, you're going to launch the encryptor, and you're going to set your persistence and show their message. Now, there is also a phase that I didn't, sh that is part of the process, which is to deploy a dropper, right? So, how many of you, do you guys know what a dropper is? Right, so this varies. I've, so, I've seen this vary. So if the malicious party wants to gain control and do lateral movement and do more than just ransomware, you're going to need to deploy a dropper, right? It deploys a dropper. So it deploys essentially, you know, your rat or, or a toolkit like that. The issue with that is in terms of, remember this is for a demo environment, so I wanted simplicity. If you do a dropper, you need a server, you need obfuscation techniques, because those are actually detected by antivirus programs, and you need a payload system, right? So you need to be able to build all that. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that later. But it's something to consider when you're doing this. So then we go to the encryptor, right? So you need to understand encryption, essentially. So if we go back in time, the first type of encryption... Sorry, I'm having problems with my pointer right now. So the first type of encryption, anybody know what this is? Yeah, say a bit louder. So this is a Caesar cipher. So a Caesar cipher was, um, so for those who don't know, 
basically Caesar during these campaigns, he, they, uh, with his generals, they wanted to share information privately. So they came up with a simple system, which we now call Rot 13, uh, which is the second one here, where you basically use some kind of tool which allows you to realign the letters, right? So in the Caesar cipher, um, you basically, they had a wheel which they would turn depending on the day, depending on the code that was in, in use, and that would give them, that be, allow them to encrypt the date, to encrypt the words, and then decrypt them on the other side. Interestingly enough, um, so a friend of mine in the US used to work for the NSA a long time ago, and he actually did something like this for CIA. Uh, and they, they, this is one of the first encryption systems the CIA used in, during the Cold War, a, well, a variation of it. So, yeah, so then I said, like I said, you have ROT13, which is a very simple encryption system based on Caesar cipher. Then you go up to XORing, so using an XOR principle where you basically have an upstream data packet, you apply an, an encryption key, and then you have your encrypted information. The advantage of an XOR is actually it's reversible very easily. You then go into something more complicated, which is AES. Um, so if you know that's block cipher technology. So you basically have an initialization vector, you have your original data, you apply the ciphertext, and you keep applying it. You know, you apply the block, you take the block, reapply ciphertext for a certain period of time. And then at the top right, you have the RSA type encryption, which is you need you have some kind of key which you apply a mathematical module aspect to it. So I was looking at these encryption methods and I was like, well, AES, I could do, it's very simple, there's plenty of libraries, it's public. The problem is it's still quite complicated and you need, you need a lot of libraries. And I'll get to why you need a lot of libraries afterwards. I didn't want this to be too complicated. So at the end, I just said, okay, let's just use XOR. XOR is really simple, right? So it's exclusive disjunction. So basically, when you apply your key, if you apply an XOR to, to, to a value with zero, it equals zero. If you do A, if you apply the value to the XOR, the value to itself, it's zero as well. If you start applying a key, essentially you get this mathematical logic, which basically says that you can, the key, as long as the key stays the same, it's equal to, you know, you can reverse it quite easily and it's equal to itself. So that was the prince, that's the key, that's the system that I chose. It's easy to implement. There's plenty of single, you know, one line code to actually do this. It's really simple. So that's simplicity is a really good thing in this, in this type of environment. So what do you need? Well, we've got a math, we've got the side on the encryption. So I need a place to develop this. Why do you need a place to develop this? Well, think about it, right? You are going to do some code. You're going to want to test that code. It's a natural for a developer, right? He writes his code compiles it, runs it, whatever, and he applies it and he tests it. Problem is, if you accidentally, if you accidentally hit something at the same time, this happens. You encrypt your environment. So, interestingly enough, the first script I wrote to actually do this, I messed up the encryption algorithm, well, the encryption code, and the reverse didn't work. So I basically encrypted my environment. Luckily, I did it in VMware. And I said, oh, I was like, okay, so an hour's worth of work down the drain. Revert to my snapshot and restart. So that's why using VMware and snapshot technology, not necessarily VMware, but using a virtual environment with a snapshot technology and snapshotting often and frequently is really useful in this type of situation because it's really easy to make a mistake, right? So the principle that I decided on was to use a scripting technology, an interpreter, and download that interpreter, well, apply that interpreter via Word document. And the reason I got into this situation is I was doing, so I was doing some testing, I recompiled the Word document, and then I accidentally hit enter on the keyboard because I was distracted, and the focus was on the Word document in Explorer, the Word document opened, and that was the end of the day. Okay, <laughs> so you got to be careful what you're doing. It's always good to have a VMware in place, and you need to think about things like that. So choose your tools wisely. Wisely, VMware being one of them. Um, there's another aspect to the tools: choosing the tools wisely because 
depending on the type of tool that you're using, you're going to have more or less functionality and ability to actually deploy. If you're compiling a binary from scratch, it's really easy. The problem is you need a full development in infrastructure. So you need something like this, right? You need Visual Studio or Eclipse. So how many of you have used Visual Studio and Eclipse? It's a fucking resource hog, right? Especially Eclipse. I can't even open Eclipse anymore because it just annoys the crap out of me. Um, and I didn't want that. I wanted something simple. This is just, I just needed to do this really quickly because I was like one week away from, do, from, from a sales kickoff where I needed to give this to the sales guys, well, to the pre-sales guys. So, and it needs to be easy to deploy. I originally tested this with PowerShell. And funnily enough, this was before they actually, somebody actually launched the PowerShell script, uh, encryption. The problem I found was that if you were hitting Windows 10, it worked really well because Windows 10 has a full PowerShell stack inside. If you were hitting a Windows 7 box, it doesn't work, mostly because Win PowerShell really isn't enabled by default on Windows 7. You actually have to, there's a very, there's a version 1.0 of PowerShell on Windows 7, but version 1.0 is very simplistic and it was really hard to actually get, any, get it to do proper encryption. You could do it, but it was just really hard. And if you wanted to do it properly, in some cases you actually needed to force the installation of Windows PowerShell. So that was just an extra step I wasn't willing to go through. So you have Python, you have PHP. Um, I ended up choosing PHP, and I'll get into that a little bit later. It's just, and you have your Word documents or Zip. The other good thing too is, um, so because I was working in a VM environment, I used Notepad++, it's free. Plus it does code highlighting, and I'm a lazy bugger. So I like to have my code highlighted to make sure I'm using the right the right, um, the right commands. So that's choosing a tool by code breakdown. So then I sat down. So I used to do UML in my past life. So I sat down and said, okay, I'm going to try and give some structure to this and make sure that I know what I'm doing. So I broke it down into a simple UML structure. So I kick off the program. I set the key. I set the starting path. So that's important. Most ransomwares will just look for every disk on the endpoint and encrypt, and even go to shares, right? I didn't want, need that. I just needed to demonstrate simple ransomware as somebody taking over somebody's endpoint. So I need to set the path, the starting path. So then, so if you look at a structure of a file system, the way it's described to the user, is essentially you have a set of folders, within folders and files within those folders, right? That is a tree. So if you've done programming in your or development in your life, what's the easiest way to pass a tree? Recursion, right? You do a recursive function, you just keep calling the function every time. So what we, so what we do here is basically we look for a folder. If we have a folder, we find the files inside, we check that the files are a certain type, we encrypt the file, we rename the file. We look if there's more files. If it's a directory, we call ourselves. Right? I didn't that I, because of the space. I didn't put the recursion in this in this. So this is what the code looks like. Right? It's very simple. So as I said, I chose PHP for a reason. I'll talk about that in a bit. But essentially, I set the code of secret. Right? So secret. I encrypt it in base64, just for the fun of it, just to hide it in the script, so that a simple user, if he finds the script and opens it, can't see the key. Because I've done it a little bit lazy, so I didn't take out the comment. <laughs> so the key's up there. So you can have very varying lengths of keys, of course, but it doesn't really matter because you're, it's your math, it's your XORing function that will take care of the actual positioning. You then start to parse your disk. Now, we avoid these directories on Windows. There's some, um, later on, there's some Mac ones as well. Does anybody know why I want to avoid those directories? Can anybody think, I mentioned it a little bit earlier, but why would I avoid the system directories? Yeah, exactly, somebody said it in front. So you don't want, if you do hit those directories and you encrypt something in those directories, there's a good chance that you'll boost screen the host, right, or you'll kill the host. If you do that, you'll stop encrypting and basically it'll reboot and you haven't gotten to doing your, you might not have gotten to doing your persistence and so you, you want to avoid that. Plus, if you do do this, 
if you do encrypt this stuff, you might be encrypting things like Notepad or the preview application. And if you do that, you can't show your ransomware note, right? You need to be able to show your ransomware note, so you need to leave some functionality on the endpoint. Now, it's true that you have some, some ransomware that will encrypt the BIOS, but that's a different model, right? We're just looking at file encryption here. So then, you're going to look for, if you have a file, you're going to look for all the files with certain extensions. Because again, you don't want to encrypt DLLs. It might be useful. You want to encrypt the data that's important for, to the user or to the organization. So you want to look for office documents or subsets of office documents like text files, zip files, raw files, Excel, Word, you know, anything that you can think of. Uh, you can build a list, right? I kept it simple. I looked for the typical office documents. Then you open the file. You open the file with write mode. And then you do you apply your XOR. Right? So this is the simple XOR functionality, right? So you get the, the good thing with PHP is if you read a file into a buffer, you basically have that buffer and you can address it as an array. So the XOR, you run your you run your loop over the array, you apply your you apply your ordinal functions here. Right, so you apply you, you apply your your encryption here with the XOR. Then you rewrite your block. Now, does, does anybody? Uh, so, the, some of you guys know PHP. Do you know how this? You know what this function does, right? So, basically, open the file and read ten twenty four bytes. Right. So, why am I only reading tw ten twenty four bytes? Anybody, can anybody guess? Speed. Speed, yeah. And the thing is, you don't need to read the, encrypt the whole file. As long as you encrypt the header of the file, the file becomes useless, right? Most of the information on file systems regarding the file is at the front, is at the header of the file, right? So the description of the structure of the file, the type of file that it is, you have your magic, you know, your magic number in the head of the file. So if you read the file from zero and read, say, like 1024, 2048, 4096, you have a smaller buffer to work with. That means your application doesn't need that much memory to run, and you basically encrypt the information that's going to kill the file anyway. All right? So that's basically it. Very simple, right? What is this, like 20 lines of code? And it's roughly the same thing if you try to do an executable. Now, why did I ultimately set for PHP? And there are some gotchas when you're using an interpreter language. On the first time I did it, you know, I just downloaded the stock PHP, PHP 5, ran it, and it complained because it still needed a bunch of DLLs. Right? So, when you're doing this type of stuff, and when they're doing this type of stuff, they're going back in time. You know, they're doing they're going back to the simplest version of the interpreter that you can use. So you have to go back to the right version of the interpreter. If you go back far enough, you don't need DLLs, for example. The other thing too is something like PHP or Python is you can actually recompile your own interpreter and include everything inside the executable. So why do you need to do this? Because essentially, once you have this, right? So you've got your PHP, you've got your script. You have to put it in your Word document, or you have to make it downloadable from somewhere. So to ease that, you want to have the simplest amount of information to put into your Word document or to download from a website. Right? So you want something simple and contained. If you have to deploy multiple files and multiple DLLs at the same time, number one, it gets, more, it gets bigger, it gets more complex, plus it's, you'll start to hit detections, right? because you're installing a lot of files into the system. The less that you install, the less likely you're going to get to, you know, the more chance you have of, of avoiding t detection. Plus, by using the stock PHP, you basically get a green light from most of the antivirus vendors. Right? If you run that, if you, if, if you upload that into VT, it comes out green. Because it's PHP.
So if you go back and then do something simple, you go back in time, you basically have everything okay, right? So your script runs, there's no errors, and you get an encrypted platform. Right? So it's simplicity again, right? There's a theme to this, and that's simplicity. I want to keep it simple, but I think also the malicious party is looking at simplicity. So now you have your script, you have your executable, you need to wrap it up in a batch file and deliver it. So the easiest thing I found to do was basically package this onto package this into a, v, a Word or a, or a Visual Basic or Excel DDE. Right now you can do this manually for if you know how, what you're doing in macros. However, it's quite easy to find tools like Frodox um, readily available that will allow you to actually inject the macros. And it's really cool because you inject the macros in a hidden fa hidden way, right? So you've got all, every, all the functions, names, and everything like that are uh, obfuscated. The one that I really liked was using DDE. So I did one with Excel and using DDE. Does everybody know what DDE is? So it's it's a data data something ex, uh, extension. So it essentially allows Excel to go query databases. But you can actually get it to run CMD, right? So you're not using macros anymore. As soon as you open the file, it refreshes and does the DDE commands. So basically what it does is it launches a CMD, runs PowerShell, PowerShell downloads my executable, and then runs it. That's simple enough for PowerShell to do, and it runs on every version of PowerShell. You can also do it with a simple batch script if you need to. Right? The advantage of doing that is you don't use VB, so if VB is turned off in the, in the environment that you're attacking, it bypasses that restriction. So then, there's two, you know, you can either base64 the, the executable, put it into your Word document, or that makes the script a little bit co more complex, and I didn't, like I said, I'm, I'm a lazy bugger, so I didn't want to actually make this complex. So I was, at the time, I was, starting to, I was building this AWS environment, so I said, oh, well, I can just spin up a client existence. Real cheap, free, for a year, spin it up, put a simple web server on it, put my executable on the web server, and point my script to that executable. All right? Simple enough. So you, you, get my, you, you get where I'm going with this, right? It's really simple to implement and deploy, if you think about it. So is that enough? Well, as I said earlier in my mind map, there are some ransomwares that use droppers. So right now I have a functional ransomware. I tested it, I can deploy it, I just put it in an email, fake email that I put on the demo system, user opens it, well, the pre-sales guy opens it and demos the ransomware. So the problem is we start to see over the year, well, let, let, me, let me rephrase that. So one of the reasons that I started this down this track is because some of the things I was seeing from my, from my honeypot was that campaigns would start with simple scripts like that, right? They would use simple scripting technology like that. And over, the t over time, the variants would increase in complexity and they'd start ad adding rats and droppers, right? So they could do more things. So I was like, at this point, I was like, okay, I have one. I still got, I still got a few weeks to go before the kickoff, before I have to demo this. So I said, okay, I'll, I'll do a little bit more exploration, right? So loaders or droppers, those are the most commons that you'll find and variants of them. Zeus, Dridex, Spy, Citadel, Karma. All of those. The only problem is, anybody speak Russian? <laughs> so, since we have, so hopefully this says, that's what my Russian friend gave me, you need an introduction and speak Russian. Does that roughly translate? Thank you. So that is the problem, right? Most of this stuff is run by Russian organizations on the dark web, and to get the latest and greatest version that isn't detectable, you need to have an introduction into this environment. You need to know people who will introduce you and vouch for you. So you can find 
examples of them from the ones that have been detected and basically brought down. So luckily I have a friend, so he gave me a copy of Gaudex. So this happens to be the control panel. It's like, what? A CNC has a control panel? Yes, full-blown control panel with stats and everything. It tells me how many, of, how many hits I've had, how, how long have they been open for the past days, the locations, I have a map of where, go, where they are. So it's, and then you have a full client ID. You even get screenshots of the client. Right? So you can see what the guy's working on. Plus you can just point, you can script other things and things like that. So I say, okay, this is simple enough. Again, all I needed was a website. I already had one because I was drop, I was, I, I was publishing my executable on the website for, for it to be downloaded. So I just added the Gaudex backend to it. So there's, there's a tool set to help you build your Gaudex engine. This is really cool, isn't it? <laughs> it's, it's, the thing is, it's like, one of the reasons that we see a lot of this stuff is because there are organizations in the background that are actually building, it's, it's a software industry. There's help desk associated to some of these things. You can actually open tickets and they'll get back to you within 24 hours. Some of them have SLAs. Okay? You need, you need Bitcoin to pay for this, but you know, it's, this, this was one that's already been deactivated, so it was already pretty much useless, but, um, you know, if you use, if you use, um, you know, usual tools, you can actually, you know, recompile slightly and things like that. I mean, it's got like, you've got down here, it's hard to see, but in the profile, you can add things like anti-debugging, anti-OLE, anti-VMware. You have all these, as all these additional aspects to it, right? So, okay, this is really cool. Took me a couple hours to put into place. The other problem, too, is if you need a Russian friend because most of the instructions are in Russian, except for the interface, which is in English, because, you know, you have to sell it to everybody. <laughs> So this is the final product. Hopefully this will start, yep. So there's the phishing email. I built a nice little phishing email. So the guy opens the file. So it says enable content. Now, interestingly enough, I made it really cool. So you saw it, it actually had some action to make the user more susceptible. Originally the file was encrypted and you know he had to click enable to decrypt it, so it decrypted. Now one of the things with the, um, some of these tools is that this actually inserted an on-close macro, okay? Because one of the things with, if you're doing evasion techniques, and especially if you're trying to evade some of these, you know, malware um, detection systems, but also the explosion systems like FireEye and stuff like that, they all look for the on-open, right? So there's the on-open, so this is running, it's just the video's quite slow, and there's a reason for that. Well, it's not slow, it's just this is the time it takes. Um, so by doing it on close, you're avoiding some of those detection detection systems, right? There's also I've also introduced a significant time delay. Does anybody know why I want to introduce a, a significant time delay? Yeah, yeah. So by this, and remember, I'm doing a demo environment here. I'm trying to show potential customers the issue. So there now I have the ransomware notice up and running, if I go back to my source files, they're all encrypted. So there's a significant delay and that's intentional. So, the initial, without the dropper, without using Galdex, the initial dropper was simple, right? The encryption program was simple to do. The challenge really is to introduce those exploits like Galdex and build that system and doing the advanced techniques. The script and dropper and word file took me less than 24 hours to write. Okay, including the thinking part and everything like that. That's that was that third picture at the beginning of I'm me. That was me thinking hard. Obviously, I was half asleep. But <laughs> um, it pays. Okay, so there are studies that 38 percent ransomware victims in 2016 were paying the ransomware, but worse was that 59% of users, even in enterprises, were paying out of their own pocket because they were afraid to go to the IT help desk 
and say, oh, I'm, my, I've hit a bad email and my station's encrypted. They were afraid of being punished. You know, and that's a cultural shift in an organization. Some of the reasons that this works is because we've introduced such a scare tactics on our users, saying if this happens to you, you, you know, you fuck the organization and all this, and you're bad and blah, blah, blah. No, we need to think about awareness, right? Because this is what happens. 59% of hit, hit victims will pay out of their own pocket because they don't want to be in trouble with the organization. So we need a better way to do that user awareness when it comes to this type of activity. So if you think about my effort of 24 hours and potential payout, this is a really good return on investment, guys. Especially when you look at, some of them are like asking for $500 to get the decryption key, right? I did do a version that's standalone executable with, with C, C hash. It took me a little bit longer, but it was still within a week. So in a week, if I get, if I was a malicious person and I got five or 10 people to pay, right, $500 a shot, five grand for a week's worth of effort. I mean, I don't make that, I don't make that much money on a, in a week. Of course, it is illegal and it is different. That is potentially, you could get into trouble, some serious trouble. So, by selecting an interpreter type solution, most AVs won't trigger. And this is why it's getting passed. And some next generation systems don't trigger either. Quite a few, actually. The problem is, most next generation tech solutions, they have this switch in their configuration, which is block scripts. So, if you don't hit this switch, it doesn't block any scripting stuff, it only blocks executables. Right, so you got to be careful when if you, you if you in the defense scenario, you, even if you're going into this, some of this next generation endpoint protection stuff, you need to be careful about the settings. There's a reason that they don't do those script blocking techniques, is because a lot of organizations use scripts to manage their infrastructure. Right? How many of you manage G, you know AD structures? You have a GPO. Does your GPO deploy a script to configure the workstation? That would be blocked if you turned on script blocking. So if you start to introduce exploit kits, depending on how old they are, then you start to get detected. Because that exploit kit is actually a rat. It's actually doing you know, zero-day type activity. So it's actually looking to, to exploit the machine. So there's a little bit more structure. I also did some U, UEBA, right? So endpoint behavior analytics. I tested some of that stuff too. They look for massive file modification pattern, massive file modifications over a short period of time, right? That's how they catch the ransomware. They introduce latency into the loop to stop that, right? If you don't, if you have your script in the background running and you say encrypt one file, wait a few minutes to encrypt another file, your behavioral analytics doesn't work. Test it. Um, detection that was that was tested with a product that I shall not name. Um, because I can't, but if you're smart, you'll figure it out. Uh, detection sometimes happens through file name extensions, right? So there's two problems with that. Number one is that the file name rename usually happens after you've encrypted the file, so you're already too late. You might be able to block half the, half the encryption of the disk, but you basically lost part of your files. In an enterprise environment, that's okay because you've only lost part of your files. You can always recover those. It's easier to recover. But there's an easy way to get around that you randomize the extension on each launch. And I've been working on that. Yeah, so each time that you basically deliver your ransomware, you change the encryption, the encryption and the file extension. Most of the file extension detections are pre-embedded pre into the configuration of the endpoint security solution. It's a list that they have based on you know, existing knowledge of which encryption, which ransomwares are going out. So there are ways to bypass all of this stuff. And that's one of the things that I could probably go back into actually now, which is where we get to the evolution of what I'm, I'm this is, the idea here that I had was essentially evolve this system to see how far I could get through evasion without actually going into, into exploit techniques and things like that. 
because there's simple ways to avoid detection, like introducing latencies and things like that. So, it, right, I've stopped doing it. Um, that's not my cat. Uh, I stopped doing it for one reason, is what my, my, one of my actual cats got sick, and it was very expensive to get him fixed, and I hesitated. <laughs> right? But I don't do anything illegal, so. Thank you. That's, I think we're just on time, right? Yeah. So if you have any questions.